Hello, I'm Shihoko Goto, director of the Asia program, soon to be renamed the Indo-Pacific program at the Wilson Center. Thank you very much for joining us today. The Wilson Center was chartered by the US Congress in 1968. And since its founding, it has remained a staunchly nonpartisan think tank based in Washington, focused on international affairs. Today, we will be focusing on rising expectations for the Japanese economy and prospects for Japan to lead global growth. In recent weeks, we've seen Japanese share prices trending higher, the Nikkei reaching record highs this month and above, um, reaching above previously uh, recorded highs in 1989. It seems like a great time to invest in Japanese assets more broadly, and there's certainly a great deal of interest from investors, uh, which is particularly becoming stronger from overseas, as Japan has been seen as attractive compared to China, which is beginning to lose its allure. But share prices from the United States, as well as Europe, uh, together with Japan, continue to surge. There is still, nonetheless, a nagging question about just how high prices can go and whether we're actually now seeing the peak. The stock market does not reflect economic reality. Uh, for Japan, uh, the question is whether the country has now turned a corner and the Japanese economy is on solid footing for growth and that there will be more spending power for consumers, more entrepreneurship, and perhaps most importantly, more confidence from Japan um, about its economic future. These are big questions uh, to, uh, to ask, and we have a all-star panel to address some of our concerns. First off is Izumi Devalier, who is a managing director and head of Japan economics based in Tokyo for BOA Securities. In this role, she is responsible for the analysis of the Japanese economy and markets, as well as disseminating B of A's global economic views to Japanese clients. She was ranked the number one Japan economist in the 2023 Institutional Investor Global Fixed Income Research Survey for the fourth year running. Uh, she is a superstar. Robert Feldman is a senior advisor at Morgan Stanley MUFG Securities, where he has worked since 1998. In addition to his Morgan Stanley work, he has, he has become an outside director at Tokyo Marine Holdings. And from 2017 to 22, he was a professor at the Tokyo University Science Management of Technology program. He's also a celebrity. He's a commentator on Japan's nightly business program, World Business Satellite. Um, and then finally, we have Kenji Kushida, uh, who is a senior fellow of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's Asia program. And he directs the Japan research and programming uh, called Innovative Japan, Global Japan. And he also leads the Japan Silicon Valley Innovation Initiative at Carnegie. Uh, Kenji was previously a research scholar at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University, where he spearheaded the Stanford uh, Silicon Valley New Japan project. Uh, he's also a senior advisor to Macro Advisory Partners, um, and he's also a fellow at the Cannon Institute for Global Studies. Um, so with that, why don't I start off um, with the first question to Izumi. Where is all this investment um, interest for Japan coming from? And what makes the Japanese market particularly attractive to investors right now? Uh, thanks, Shihoko, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So uh, let me jump right in and address the question. I think uh, the biggest uh, driver behind this increased interest in Japanese assets uh, over, I would say, the past six months is the perceived shift in Japan's macro environment towards one of structurally higher inflation and wage growth. And before I get into that, I should really address the context. So as, as listeners probably know, you know, for nearly two and a half decade, Japan has been stuck in a, a equilibrium of low growth, low inflation, low rates, and therefore low volatility. 
Um, the original shock that threw Japan into the slow growth, low inflation regime was the burst of the late 80s asset bubble and the painful deleveraging process that followed it. Now, by the time that former Prime Minister Abe rose to power and launched the Abenomics program in 2013, including the first arrow of extraordinary BOJ easing, low expectations, whether for wage hikes or prices or growth, had effectively become entrenched. And I think this kind of hardened into a negative feedback loop where the expectation that wages wouldn't rise prompted consumers to balk at price hikes. And since corporates couldn't hike prices, they didn't raise wages and restrain spending. Now, if you fast forward today, uh, there are increasing signs that these expectations, which the government and BOJ tried so hard to shake, are finally moving. So if you look at inflation today in Japan, we have the stickiest, most stable measures of inflation rising from what was around you know, an underlying trend of zero uh, of the 2010s to something closer to 2%. Um, if you look at last year's Shinto spring wage negotiations, we saw average increases in headline pay of 3.7% if you include seniority-based pay rises. Or if you focus on the pure uh, base pay hikes that correlate more strongly with macro wages, base pay hikes were 2.1%. Now this year, unions have been even more aggressive in their demands, and it actually looks like average base pay may settle around 3.5% or perhaps even higher. Uh, which would mark a three-decade high. And from this perspective, we're watching uh, the initial uh, response and estimates of these negotiations very closely uh, when they come out on uh, this Friday, March 15th. So all in all, you know, although the equilibrium is fragile, uh, which is precisely the reason why the Bank of Japan is going to continue to tread very cautiously with the pace and degree of policy normalization, I think investors now assess that the likelihood that we transition from the negative feedback loop that I discussed earlier to a more positive feedback loop of rising prices, wages, and spending is much higher. And given that these developments are in part being supported by structural factors, such as demographic headwinds, uh, labor shortages, I think they've raised the expectations that these forces are here to stay and these trends will not reverse. If anything, I would argue that the structural tailwinds for higher inflation and wages is arguably going to intensify over the next five years. So that's the context. Now, this shift to an inflation regime after two and a half decades of near zero price growth has some very important implications for financial markets uh, that I think are only just being appreciated. So let's start with the household and private sector investment behavior. So if you look at Japanese households, they famously have a lot of cash. Uh, to, spe to be specific, about 2,000 trillion yen, which uh, in current exchange rate is about 14 trillion US dollars. Um, and around 55% of those household asset assets, or a little over 1,000 trillion, is in cash, which is obviously a lot. Now, with inflation basically at zero, and sometimes even negative, uh, over the past two and a half decades, there was no cost for keeping the money in cash. Uh, but this won't be the case if inflation sticks and more and more households realize that cash is losing value. Uh, it's also interesting, I think, that all of this, this mac change in the macro environment is coinciding with a concerted government push to get households to move out of savings and into investment. So this is characterized, for example, by the expansion of the Nippon Individual Savings Account, or NISA scheme, which is a tax-free stock investment program for individuals that was expanded significantly from this January and which is stoking a higher retail investor interest uh, in equities. I think the same thing can be said for corporates, uh, except with the formerly dead money sitting on their balance sheets, going to things like CapEx, share buybacks, and M&A. And I think here too, the move is being supported by initiatives by the Tokyo Stock Exchange to improve capital efficiency. Um, finally, I would argue that the return of inflation in Japan and with it a potential uh, gradual rise in Japanese interest rates also has very important implications for global fixed income markets, including the U.S. Treasury market. So under the low inflation, low growth, low in interest rates regime, 
Japanese institutional investors, such as banks, insurance companies, pension funds, have over time increased their allocation to foreign bonds. Now, it's, at, at some point, actually, the holdings of these private institutional investors, uh, excluding the Japanese government, reached three trillion U.S. dollars at the peak. And Japan, as you may know, is also the largest for, foreign holder of U.S. Treasury securities uh, at, at one point one trillion dollars, and that's ahead of China. Um, if Japan's underlying inflation rise continues to rise and be sustained uh, as we expect, so should the uh, yields on Japanese government bonds, which would make it more attractive for Japanese institutional investors to increase their allocation to domestic bonds. Now, I want to stress that given the BOJ's caution around policy normalization and the desire to avoid excessive volatility and an unwanted di disruption in the Japanese bond markets, this process, like everything in Japan, is likely to be gradual. But inflation and rates rise in Japan, it will, at the margin, affect the global fixed income markets. So uh, that's, uh, that's a wrap from my end. Over to you, Shihoko. No, that's great. Thanks very much, Izumi, for that really great overview of how Japan has come to the stage where it, there is what you call a positive kind of feedback and the trajectory is really up on the upswing. If I may, um, you've talked about um, Japanese institutional investors. Um, could you also talk a little bit about foreign interest, overseas investors' interest in Japan? Now, who are they and what are they particularly interested in? Yes, so I think the the greatest example of the increased interest in um, foreign investor uh, by foreign investors in Japanese markets is in the equity markets, right? So you mentioned uh, the rally in uh, the Japanese equities to all time highs, and initially that move was being driven by overseas investors who have you know who uh, were uh, excited about the changes that they were seeing in uh, TSE Tokyo Stock Exchange policies to uh, get uh, corporates to help, uh, you know, improve capital efficiency. Um, so I think um, historically overseas investors, you know, uh, the, one of the reasons why they have been reluctant to, to invest in Japan is this lack of, you know, inflation and the lack of pricing power. Um, but that's changing, as I mentioned. And I think coupled with the uh, um, reform expectations and expectations of, you know, higher ROE, uh, that's, that's been uh, the main point of interest there. Thank you. Let me turn to, to Robert now. So Izumi's given us a good overview, but um, inflationary pr pressure can be a blessing for investors, but also a curse for consumers. Um, same can be said about the foreign exchange rate. A weekend is great for uh, exporters, but it's not so great for consumers. Where are we when we look at some of the macro uh, situation of the Japanese economy? And where the Japanese economy is actually heading as it looks to be competitive to actually break through that um, what has what it has what has been weighing down the Japanese economy over the past decades of, of stagnant growth? Uh, thanks very much. I think I can add a couple things to what uh, Izumi just uh, uh, told us about. Um, in terms of this uh, uh, positive um, uh, cycle <clears throat> that she mentioned, uh, the key thing here is that wages have to rise faster than prices. Okay? Uh, so if uh, inflation is at 3% uh, and wages are at 6 people are going to be pretty happy. Okay, so we do see the inflation rate, the price inflation rate going up. But what is uh, to ensure uh, that we can continue to have the large wage increases uh, continue that um, uh, Izumi just mentioned? There, the key uh, is productivity. Um, Japan uh, has very, there are various measures of productivity. You can use output per worker, you can use output per hour, you can use so called uh, total uh, factor productivity. Um, I like to use the simplest one, which is output per worker. It's got its problems, but I like to use that uh, because it shows a very, very, very clear deceleration over the last few few years. All uh, uh, developed economies have a productivity problem, uh, but it may have been particularly uh, bad in Japan. Although right now we're seeing a couple things that can uh, are, I believe, coming along to change this. 
Uh, we'll get into uh, Kenji's elements in, in just a couple of minutes. But one of them uh, is the uh, more liquid labor market. Um, when I talk to some of my students from uh, Tokyo University of Science, these are mid-career people. Average age is 43. It's a great program. Uh, they are moving jobs at a, a rate that uh, I could never have imagined uh, a decade ago. Uh, so the idea, as we say in Japanese, of a tekzai tekisho, uh, getting the right person in the right job, that's much more accepted now. Uh, young people are moving more. And ideas move with people. Uh, so that when we see new technologies come, on, uh, come out of the woodwork, uh, when we see new ideas, people combine them a little bit differently. Um, that's where you see these uh, these uh, changes in productivity. And that's, I think, the, the underlying theme that we need to look, uh, look to uh, in order to um, confirm uh, that this uh, positive cycle that Izumi talked about uh, will really uh, be there. Um, another thing, this is both macro and uh, micro in a way, is investment. The labor shortage is extremely serious already, and it's going to get worse. I was at a, a tonkatsu, a, a pork cutlet place the other night, and uh, the service was terrible. Um, and my wife and I usually go there. There are usually four waiters and they're doing this and that. There were two waiters and they didn't know what they were doing because the firm had not had enough time or resources to train them to do the right thing. Uh, so what's happening uh, is that in many restaurants and the further down the quality curve you go, the more you see this, they are automating the ordering and delivery process. So, for example, one of our other favorite places has little QR codes that you put into your own phone uh, in order to order your meal. Um, and this is working very, very well. So they're saving labor through these investments. That's why investment is rising at, at all, uh, at, you know, to all time highs now. Uh, and we think this is going to continue. Now, the macroeconomics of this is very interesting uh, because if you're going to have more investment for a given amount of output, you need a little less something else. So the question to me is, how are we going to balance the longer term productivity needs of the economy for higher uh, investment with the shorter term needs of raising wages and increasing consumption? Um, I think they've got it about right at the moment, uh, but it's, it's this uh, process, process of productivity, wages, prices, and then the uh, animal spirits that come from somewhat rising prices. That's the, the key thing in that part of the debate. Another thing that uh, Izumi mentioned was the, um, the, the debt levels and the longevity uh, challenges. This is an area where Japan has been a pioneer. In fact, uh, if at Morgan Stanley this year, one of our great global themes is longevity. And when this theme came up the first time, I stuck up my hand and said, hey, we're first on that. Let me, let me write the first paper, which I did. Um, and I discovered some really interesting things. Uh, if you think about the total net interest payments, of the government, okay? What would you think they are? 1%, 2%, 3% of GDP? When I ask my uh, clients here, most people say two, a few were at one. The real answer is zero. Net interest payments for the government sector are zero. And the reason is partly as uh, Izumi said that they have such large Forex reserves and they're earning a very large amount of money on those, but borrowing to fund those reserves at a very low domestic interest rate. So they're running a, a, a very large uh, ARB uh, transaction here, which is generating a huge amount of money. Also, the Bank of Japan owns half of the debt. And the interest payments on that debt go right back to the Ministry of Finance. Um, so the uh, debt burdens don't seem all that bad. The average um, duration of the debt is nine years. So even if global interest rates come up, Japan is not facing an immediate uh, fiscal crisis. Things have to be done. Okay? But again, this really actually takes us back to productivity, because when we think about longevity, um, we often think of it as, oh, we have to do something about medical costs, we have to do something about pension costs, and that's true. But there are two parts to this argument from the viewpoint of uh, financial markets. Um, one is uh, the numerator, that is what happens to debt, and the other is the denominator, what happens to GDP because it's the debt ratio that matters. Uh, whoops, excuse me for a sec. My cat is having a little uh, little problem in the background here. Oh my, poor dear. Um, she didn't like her medicine this morning. Anyway, um, so uh, the numerator is kind of under control. Japan has done a reasonably good job 
uh, of controlling medical costs, uh, creating pension adjustment methodologies, et cetera. So that part doesn't seem like it's going to be too uh, uh, too out of control. Uh, however, the productivity, which is what generates or drives the denominator, now the GDP, that's where we have to work. And so the, another conclusion from this piece uh, that I uh, wrote was that we need um, the growth rate of productivity to exceed the growth rate of real uh, spending on pensions and medical by about one percentage point. That has not really been achieved yet. Now, there's a good uh, chance that they'll do it because of all the new technology, because of the more flexible labor market, but uh, that still remains to be seen. So I would focus on those uh, longevity challenges. Uh, and finally, if I can add, I think Japan is developing from the bottom up a new grand strategy. Uh, there are you know, geopolitical issues now that are very serious, and that has a lot of people in Japan scared. Um, the fact that the U.S. may not be as reliable uh, an ally as it looked like before, that has a lot of people very scared. Uh, and so this grand strategy is sort of bubbling up uh, from the bottom. Um, this will have immense impact on a, a few sectors, and this will take us into Kenji's area. But I'm focusing on energy, agriculture, AI, uh, healthcare. And actually, it's a switch from a sick care system to a healthcare system. And then finally, education, particularly reskilling, because that's what will enable people to move jobs and to raise productivity. So there's a uh, call it a, a grand strategy element uh, of all of this as well. Let me stop there. Yeah, th thank you, Robert. Um, before I turn to Kenji, if I can kind of pick up where you left on, on this grand strategy issue, right? Mm -hmm. So the geopolitical risks are high. In, mm -hmm. in Asia right now. And mm -hmm. what's interesting in Japan is that previous debates about Japan enhancing its uh, military spending mm -hmm. has not really faced any opposition. The concern mm -hmm. though is more about actually affording that mm -hmm. spending and how that's going to be spent. And you note that um, Japan should be able to uh, mm -hmm. grapple with the challenge of uh, medical costs and uh, and uh, educational spending and the like, despite mm -hmm. a shrinking population. I'm wondering how this increased spending mm -hmm. um, pressure mm -hmm. on the Japanese government can actually mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may, there are a couple of things I would point out. Uh, one uh, is the role of technology, which I'm sure Kenji will get into. But um, in medical care in particular, uh, new technologies tend to raise costs. That's a little weird. You know, most industries, better technology causes costs to go down, but not in medical, because we're treating diseases that uh, could never be treated before. People live longer, and so costs go up. So the key thing now is to use some of the wonderful new uh, genome technology, stuff like that to shift the system, as I mentioned before, from a sick care system to a health care system uh, so that we spend less uh, on health care overall. This is possible. It won't solve everything. Uh, spending on uh, health uh, per person for the elderly is much, much higher than it is uh, on, on younger people. But uh, using those technologies and shifting to a, a, a real health care system or a preventive health care system will be one, uh, one major uh, element. Um, so basically, uh, that plus um, better education and better moving people around. What's happening in education now is absolutely stunning. Uh, when COVID hit and uh, my uh, Tokyo University of Science classes had to shift to Zoom, we uh, noted that there was a huge, huge increase in uh, the uh, productivity of, of the education. And now uh, educational institutions uh, have the ability uh, to do very, very large scale, very, very effective types of education. And I think Japan has a lot of wonderful, uh, you know, comic book approaches to education uh, that are uh, quite, uh, quite um, informative and very easy for people to understand. There's a mathematician from uh, my university there who illustrated conic sections by taking a big cone of, uh, of konyaku and cutting it in different slice, uh, uh, slices. So this, the, the horizontal slice was a circle, the slightly curved slice was a, an ellipse, uh, make it too high and it turns into a hyperbola. Um, so there's a lot of wonderful education things that could be done here. And that's just starting. 
Thanks for that. So, uh, Kenji, um, we've we've talked a lot about uh, the future of uh, the Japanese economy. We've talked, Robert's talked about um, the virtuous cycle of increases, increasing wages and increasing productivity. All of this adds to social change, right? It's also a challenge for Japan to reimagine its future. Japan has been, had been an innovation nation. We have companies like Sony, Honda, Toyota. They have big entrepreneurs behind them. That kind of innovative drive in Japan is not seen to be propelling the economy. But are we now seeing a renaissance in entrepreneurship and in individuals actually taking risks? Are we seeing younger people becoming more involved in harnessing the power of the digital economy and propelling the Japanese economy forward? Great questions. And uh, thanks again for having me. Wonderful uh, to be part of this. This past 25 minutes was the most elucidating that I've seen in years for understanding the macro picture and specifics. So I think it's right now a really, really exciting time. And I'm going to give you three places to look at, plus a bonus later, to look at the cutting edge of some of the more innovative parts of uh, corporate Japan that I think are severely understated uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll get into. The first one, uh, I'm sitting here in Silicon Valley, and the kinds of things that are win-win collaborations between big Japanese companies and Silicon Valley companies. Uh, I've been at the uh, at the in the middle of this kind of thing for about 15 years now. Uh, there's a real sense that the exciting opportunities for Japanese companies are bearing fruit in ways that were not happening five years ago, 10 years ago, definitely not 15 years ago. Part of this is because the technological paradigm right now of AI, robotics, uh, interest in climate tech, uh, healthcare, this is just right for uh, big Japanese companies that tend to be better at implementing things rather than coming up with radical new sets of technologies. So whenever we're in the long arc of history and implementation phase, that's when we would expect to, and we are indeed seeing some of the uh, Japanese companies doing interesting things. Some of my favorite examples include, for example, uh, Komatsu, uh, uh, global scale construction equipment company. They are operating in something like 170 plus countries around the world. Uh, they met up with a Silicon Valley uh, company that uses drones to make 3D maps of construction sites, right? So if we think of productivity that Robert was just saying, uh, to survey construction sites uh, before or during, it take, took a bunch of people with tripods taking measurements, maybe two weeks. Uh, they got that down to about 15 minutes, uh, where you can monitor your construction site all the time, almost real time, and optimize all sorts of things. Well, Komatsu couldn't have done this alone. The Silicon Valley startup Skycatch, by partnering with Komatsu, used Komatsu as a global platform to accelerate their growth, right? This is a possible model. They could not have done uh, the technological improvements by themselves because say Komatsu, uh, construction equipment, it's windy, it's hot, it's cold. Uh, there are tornadoes. Well, I don't think you do drones and tornadoes, but point being all these conditions that where it's literally like this behind me uh, most of the year, you don't learn how to improve that quickly. But partnering with Komatsu got them immediately into global markets. This was good for the investors into that startup because from the investors that don't really care about Japan per se, uh, but by becoming a good customer and co-developing technology together with the Silicon Valley startup, this helped blitz scale the startup, which was a good thing for the venture capitalists. So when you get venture capitalists interested in uh, the very fast growth of their companies, uh, their startups, can then use global platform Japanese companies, then we're starting to get in a type of win-win collaboration uh, that provides. And so something like seven years uh, on in this collaboration, 60,000 plus sites around the world, uh, this Komatsu Skycatch collaboration happened. Another uh, important set of technologies that are developing uh, partly due to the very deep pain points along the lines of what uh, Robert was mentioning is not enough people. So upskilling, but through the machines. 
if we think of AI, artificial intelligence, as primarily replacing people, but intelligence augmentation, IA, as upskilling people, Kawansa famously rolled out um, almost a decade ago systems where you could be your first day as a licensed operator of one of these uh, diggers, but you can do if very advanced uh, until then it takes 10 plus years of experience to do this kind of movement uh, with the bucket where you just hover the bucket above, put push hybrid, and then it'll make the cut for you. So this kind of upskilling uh, is one of the areas that's a technological potential for raising people's productivity. And because there are deep pain points in the domestic market uh, where there aren't, literally aren't enough skilled workers, then developing and investing in the technologies to solve this are well worth it. So that's one area to look at. Other interesting collaborations that might be not quite intuitive, but are interesting, since these big Japanese companies are cash rich, uh, there's been a plethora of corporate venture capital uh, and investing in independent venture capital firms, uh, direct investing into startups that we see in Silicon Valley. So we have things like Tokyo Gas uh, investing in a offshore wind turbine company to try to make uh, electricity as an offshore. And of course, since the ocean gets very deep right across, right, right very quickly off of the Japanese archipelago, uh, then another company that Japan Airlines venture capital invested in called PowerX, which is a Japanese startup, one of their avenues of business is to put big batteries on large ships to carry the electricity from these offshore wind farms to uh, places that can use the electricity. Oh, and by the way, when there's a disaster, that would come in awfully handy uh, in many places. So uh, this kind of set of collaborations where uh, the startup isn't doing something that the big company is already doing, but the startup can then shift the direction of which way the big company can move. This is one of the core patterns of um, potential between startup large company collaboration that we're starting to see in Japan's startup ecosystem. So this is my second point. Um, the second point is Japan's startup ecosystem is maturing uh, much more rapidly than observers of sort of traditional Japan give credit for, because if you look at the parts of traditional Japan, it looks very traditional. Uh, if you look at the startup ecosystem, it looks very different. Uh, and then now there's more symbiosis between the two. And part of the reason that the startup ecosystem took a long time to mature is, um, I have a line of work on this, but basically there are many different components that are complementary to each other that hold everything else back because they have to develop together. Venture capital works best when there's high labor mobility because you need people to leave companies to make new companies and the companies, most of them don't work out. So those people have to go elsewhere. If you're not, uh, if you're not confident that you're gonna get another job after making a jump from a large company to a startup, if the startup doesn't work, that means the risk profile is way too high. If you have a fairly uh, high confidence that, okay, that startup doesn't work, but there are a lot of new startups coming up, then I can find my next gig. Then it's not such a big risk. So it's in some way not about taking more risk, it's that there's less risk because the ecosystem is getting mature. And so other aspects of the startup ecosystem, right? Venture capital, human capital mobility, uh, government, sort of how much support is there? and the five-year plan of startups, this is, if anything, if nothing else, it's a big legitimizing factor, right? Joining a startup doesn't mean it's a fly-by-night sketchy operation, uh, almost by default, which is what people would have regarded this 15 years, 20 years ago, uh, where people like Mikitani-san of Rakuten were reporting that the, the he tried to hire people out of college, their parents would show up at the headquarters saying, please do not, uh, uh, hire my child, they, this, this, they, they shouldn't be working for you, this kind of thing. That's no longer uh, increasing, and you know, Robert's students, et cetera, at uh, uh, various top universities, one of the default career choices that's totally socially acceptable is to join a startup. Uh, once more people around you in college join startups, then more people can then join startups. It's a positive feedback loop. And, uh, and we can go on about you need university experience uh, to spin out 
promising technologies in labs from scientific labs. Well, unless you do that a few times, the university doesn't know to how to handle it. There isn't a culture among uh, academics on how to do that or accumulated know-how. And so these things are all maturing, which is great. Uh, third point, I, I'd like to uh, sort of reconceptualize how we think of big Japanese firms. Uh, regardless of what mental model you use, I think that one of the important ones that should be out there is that our world has a global fabric of Japanese multinational firms that operate all over the world. A lot of them are localized to some extent, but they're still quintessentially Japanese in headquarters. So a lot of these global Japanese companies are focusing on their main businesses and they're doing quite well at them, uh, right? Diking is doing great. The trading companies, the six big ones are great. Uh, uh, materials, Asahi Garasu, the others are doing, AGC, they're doing well. But at the same time, they see that their core businesses are being threatened. Uh, the world is more uncertain. Technological disruptions keep happening. So they're also looking into new things. Uh, what kinds of new things can be done? And this is where we go back to our uh, previous example of the Japanese companies being a global platform. So uh, there's case after case, interesting case after case of uh, Actually, Robert, you said you were on uh, Tokyo Marine uh, Holdings of the board, but uh, some big Japanese insurers, what we're starting to see in Silicon Valley, they partner with a, uh, let's say, a cu customer experience optimization using AI that gets uh, uh, lots of data and sort of improves the customer journey over time, but they don't deploy it in Japan. Uh, they deploy it in their Southeast Asian operation. Uh, for various reasons. there It's a growth market. It's simpler. There isn't as much existing organizational structure that needs to be pushed aside. Uh, internal company politics are simpler. So if we think of these Japanese global multinational companies as a fabric from which, and all of these have innovation outposts in various parts of the world, uh, in Asia, uh, many had them in Israel, Honda invested in a, uh, a fusion, a, a nuclear fusion company in Israel. Uh, and, and so some of these are far out bets, but they're right there and they're fairly cash rich. These investments are not very big compared to what their core uh, operations are. And there seems to be much more than just lip service that we saw maybe a decade ago. Oh, we need to do open innovation. Now there actually is a lot of that happening. So, um, and then let me just flag the fourth point and uh, I'm about to launch a big project on how uh, Japan's demographic challenges are major technological opportunities, right? The aging, depopulation, uh, the incredible figures of 30 plus percent of people are, will be 65 and above living by themselves in some of the more rural prefectures. Uh, the average age of farmers being in you know, the upper 60s uh, in certain regional parts, the uh, deregulation of taxi drivers allowing 80 plus year olds to drive taxis. Uh, on the other hand, ride share isn't. Uh, and then by one of the scarier ones, by 2040, uh, by some estimates by the Ministry of Health and Welfare, roughly one in every 14 Japanese in the population will have some form of dementia. So a lot of things need to change very quickly in society once we hit that juncture. And this is all visible. So through the mechanism of what we saw earlier, deep pain points because there aren't enough people to do the jobs that can't be done, providing an opportunity to invest. Well, then Japan is ahead of the curve. Population uh, line slopes are not that different across many advanced industrial countries, but Japan's ahead. So then the solutions here can make Japan a leader uh, with followers as opposed to what we saw historically in some of the IT areas, like the wonderful cell phones leading without followers, which is what happened. And then they got disrupted. So, so th there we go, back to you, Shinko. Thank, thank you so much, Kenji. And definitely, um, we talk often about the negative aspects of the demographic challenge, but at the same time, there are opportunities. And one thing is very clear that the world is looking towards Japan to come up with novel ways 
to deal with the problem, which can also create new opportunities, new business opportunities, and an impetus for technological innovation as well. Um, I was remiss. Um, I do want to point out that we are taking questions from the audience. Um, if you look below the screen, um, you are able to uh, submit questions. Um, please um, identify yourself um, as it is stated and put your question and I can I can get to them. I have one big open-ended question for all three of you. China's economy is slowing down. What does that mean? Does this is this does this create opportunities for uh, more investment to come to Japan, more innovation to occur in Japan? Does it strengthen Japan's economic base, or is it are, are there more downside risks to the expectation of a continued slowdown um, in China? Let me first turn to you, Izumi, and then we'll kind of go back to where we how we started. Yeah, so um, I would argue that you know if, if you look at the uh, the context of China's slowdown, it is part. I mean, in part, it is due to uh, the correction from you know the uh, pop the property investment um, and some of the excesses in the sector. But overall, I think it's part of China's development process, right? So. Um, in the, in, the, in the high phase of China's growth uh, in the 2000s and then in, earlier in the 2010s, uh, growth was um, driven by uh, not only, you know, expansion of labor supply, but the improvement, uh, significant improvement in productivity productivity as you're plucking um, people from, you know, farming sector into manufacturing um, into the cities. Um, and I think, you know, this this uh, development phase is still ongoing. And now the transition is from moving from, for example, low value added manufacturing to higher value added manufacturing um, and, you know, also developing a services sector. Um, uh, so, I, I I would say you know China uh, does have its challenges, but um, part of this is I think a, the natural development process. Now, in terms of implications for Japan, I do think there's uh, both uh, opportunities and challenges. So on the opportunity front, you know um, the, the the again. Uh, partly because of um, the uh, geostrategic tensions, I think it is true that investors and corporates are looking at increasing uh, manufacturing capacity and investment in Japan, uh, particularly in the kinds of high tech se sectors that are the most sensitive. And I think you see that a, a lot with the Japan's semiconductor um, policy. Uh, and, you know, if you go to Kyushu, for example, in the southwestern Japan these days, there's a booming economy uh, in Kumamoto as uh, TSMC and, you know, uh, the semiconductor um, uh, operations launch up. So uh, I think part of this is also the fact that if you look at, you know, labor costs, um, because of the weaker yen, Japan uh, is it's just now a lot cheaper to do business in Japan. Um, so there's some opportunities there, but I think the challenge is, is that I think when we discuss China, there's a sense to uh, there's a tendency to argue in extremes, especially in the foreign press. So either uh, China is um, this great investment opportunity doing great, or there's just extreme sense of doom and gloom. Um, and I think that misses some of the nuances that are occurring in the Chinese economy. Um, for all the focus on the challenges in the Chinese property markets, there is a lot of innovation happening in China as well. I would say China is the mo one of the most competitive product markets with the most, um, uh, you know, one of the more sophisticated consumer bases uh, where if you cannot, you know, deliver uh, attractive new products, you're basically um, out of competition. So there's dynamism in not just the consumer sector, but, you know, we're also seeing a lot of great leaps in um, areas like uh, electronic vehicles and other parts of manufacturing. And I think that does pose um uh, a challenge for Japanese uh, manufacturers, especially as they compete for mark, uh, market share abroad. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a double, um, it, it's, it's both a, you know, source of opportunities, but also challenges, especially for Japan Inc. Robert, 
thoughts? Well, I would just, uh, if I uh, may echo some of the things uh, Izumi-san just said. Uh, one is that the, the excellence of Chinese uh, technology, they've got just brilliant scientists uh, and engineers working on a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, you can even see that in the Western literature because it's very uh, hard to find a, a, a sort of a great new innovation in energy or this or that or the other that doesn't have uh, a Chinese author on the um, uh, on the paper, um, whether they're uh, you know formally Chinese or uh, in China now. So the the technology base there is absolutely stunningly good. Uh, where I uh, see issues uh, are uh, really in uh, some of the cult of philosophy of growth. Uh, to what extent is China pulling back uh, from a market mechanism for allocating uh, assets uh, that was rising for a long time? Now it seems to be pulling back. Uh, if you have government allocations of resources, they'll often go to the wrong places. Um, so that's one issue. Uh, and the other one, uh, as Izumi mentioned, was the uh, non-performing loan issue. Um, China, from my point of view, is in the stage that Japan was in uh, around, call it 1991-92, um, where it's very difficult for a growth model that was quite successful to look inside itself and say, you know, this is just not working the way it used to. And of course, there are many vested interests that want to uh, uh, want to keep things the way they are. So for me, uh, one of the keys to a more vibrant uh, Chinese economy is whether they will do what Prime Minister Koizumi did in the early uh, 2000s, which is have strict asset assessment of the uh, assets that are on the, uh, the financial institution and local government balance sheets. That makes it even harder. Uh, so I think the NPL issue is one that's going to, 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 uh, to be an, an important one. Uh, and so the question then is, can they use all this magnificent technology that they're developing to overcome some of these, uh, these problems? Over to you, Kenji. Yeah, uh, great point. So uh, let me add one slightly different angle. So how can you, as a, let's say, Japanese multinational company, harness the Chinese domestic market? You sell to it? That's great if it's growing. If it's not growing as much, then it's harder to sell to. Lots of innovation happening in uh, the Chinese market for the Chinese market. How can you carry some of that as a springboard into global markets. So for example, Chinese uh, electric vehicles, well, if you're a components manufacturer uh, and very competitive component manufacturer for that, you can ride the wave of Chinese electric vehicle exports all over the world as part of the supplier to that. So when it's goods and services, things that are very advanced that are made in China, easy to understand how that can be exported because it's literally things moving. For advanced services, uh, various things that are AI enabled that serves the Chinese domestic market, it's a little less obvious, right? Is is the is are big chunks of the world comfortable using Chinese AI driven services as one of the layers in their own service offerings? Probably not. Uh, we see the consumer right payment systems. Uh, that proliferated around Japan uh, right before the COVID shutdown, right? The uh, Alipay and these all over. But as a business, would you have one of the uh, Chinese cloud providers as one of the layers of what you're doing? As a startup, would you build it on top of some of their services? Not so obvious. And so then the question really question is, how do you capture some of that innovation that's currently fairly locked into the Chinese domestic market and has growth opportunity there, but take it elsewhere? And that's something we haven't seen, but it's something that companies struggle with. So one of the dilemmas moving forward. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from uh, Hiroaki Nakanishi, who is a member of the LDP's Chiba 5th um, District. And he asks about um, Japan, uh, the possibility of Japan being the hub for Indo-Pacific investment and growth, um, specifically when it comes to innovation of solar cell films and um, and um, semiconductor technology. I think this is more a question for Kenji. 
Yeah, well, uh, I think there's certainly potential there. One of the main questions to ask whenever we talk about does can parts of Japan be a hub for something is what are the pain points, uh, the problems that industry is trying to solve that can be only solved by doing whatever activity at that place. So if there is a cluster of small, medium firms that have incredible technology that's part of the supply chain for uh, parts of, let's say, semiconductor equipment manufacturing or solar cells, if there's a little cluster there, uh, then yes. Um, when region regions start to say, okay, we would like to be this and that, then the question is, are there resources in that locality that are uh, solving pain points for the global supply chains, the uh, investments that can go anywhere, because you're an immobile place chasing mobile assets. And so that's where I would start with. What are the specific pain points being solved? And that's a little different from saying, look, we have this kind of advanced technology. Lots of places have clusters of companies that can do very difficult things very well. The problem is that not many places might actually need these companies to do those difficult things. So things around uh, gasoline engine optimization, sure, they'll be useful for a while, but then moving even further forward, maybe not. So what other pain points can those use to be solved for? So I think using uh, this user, as in your customers, your customer, customer, or the uh, a supply chain, what are the pain points being solved? That's how I would approach this. Thanks. And I believe there are many governments um, throughout the decades that have made their own bids to become the global center of innovation, investment, what have you. But if we take, um, Izumi mentioned TSMC and Kumamoto, we see the story of two TSMC investments overseas, one in Kumamoto, one um, here in the United States and Arizona, and the success um, in TSMC's investments in Japan is really quite striking. It was ahead of, it's been ahead of schedule. Whereas TSMC's investments in, uh, in Arizona are actually behind schedule. And one of the reasons, I mean, there are many reasons for that, but one of them is that they have been able, the, the Japanese investments have been able to get support to work together with Sony to also get support from the Japanese government as well. My question is this, are there ways for the government, the Japanese government, we're in a good place now, to incentivize further Japanese investments, either to in ensure that the rally in the stock market is not a blip, that investment interest in Japan is sustained? Is there Are there policies that the Japanese government can actually pursue so that the social changes that are necessary for continued risk taking and for continued wage growth? Um, for a greater productivity to actually materialize. What would you advise the Japanese government to do right now in this time when the momentum is in their favor? Um, let me turn to you first, Robert, and then Izumi, then Kenji. Okay, thanks. There are a couple things that uh, I would push uh, because the government basically is providing public goods. Uh, mm -hmm. Among those uh, are education, so I think we need uh, a new push in the education system, not just for reskilling, as I mentioned before, but different incentives inside regular education. For example, the share of Japanese college students in STEM uh, education uh, has been falling. This should not happen. Uh, so I think we need uh, quite aggressive um, uh, incentives uh, for uh, the shrinking number of students uh, to go into the fields that are most uh, important. So uh, that's one thing I would put. Uh, another one, uh, and one of the reasons Japan has done well in the last few years is that the, the senior management now has much more international experience than it did, say, 10 or 15 years ago. I would actually encourage uh, a, a new uh, rule uh, that any uh, uh, graduate from a Japanese university must have at least one year of foreign experience. Uh, so go abroad, see a few things, come back, and then you will understand your own country better and have you know broader uh, broader uh, uh, experience. Um, in addition, um, I would uh, uh, focus on labor market flexibility. 
um, let's get rid of the, uh, the some of the rules that uh, prevent people from shifting jobs because the pensions aren't portable enough, et cetera. So I would work on the labor market, the education uh, as uh, some things that would be uh, more conducive to to keeping this uh, this uh, initiative going. Lisa me. Thanks. I think uh, Robert gave a um, really great list. So I would just add one more because we didn't really discuss it in this panel. Uh, but, you know, the, as the policies around uh, small, medium enterprises, SMEs, um, they comprise 70% of employment. And one of the, if you just look at product, you know, productivity, which we've been discussing, um, obviously the, the productivity at small, medium, there are wonderful small and medium enterprises in Japan, please don't get me wrong, but on average it's lower because they have less capital, you know, they have less of the ability to invest. Um, and that's partly a function of their lack of pricing power where they're really uh, in, you know, don't have as much uh, strength in the negotiation negotiation process with larger corporates. So, so much of the debate around SMEs in Japan and how to improve their productivity has focused on cutting off these so-called, you know, various subsidies that that um, that are perceived to be prolonging uh, zombie uh, SMEs. But, and I think there is some argument to uh, looking at the types of subsidies that are provided, but I don't think, you know, this kind of uh, stick uh, focus on just the sticks approach is going to be effective because if, um, you know, you focus on just eliminating and weeding out the weakest SMEs, you know, th that doesn't necessarily guarantee that the employees there are going to find uh, success at larger corporates. If they were struggling at uh, weaker SMEs, it most likely means that they lack the competitiveness, right, uh, to, to, uh, to see, succeed elsewhere and therefore need the kinds of reskilling opportunities that we've also been discussing. I, I think the area there that could be addressed the most that's oftentimes missing from the discussion is how to e improve the economies of scale of these SMEs. And I, th and I think that's where the biggest problem with the subsidies uh, lie. It impedes the incentive for the successful and innovative SMEs to actually get bigger because so much of these subsidies are tied to the size of the company. So I would focus on initiatives targeting, you know, encouraging, for example, M&A uh, amongst SMEs, giving tax breaks uh, for SMEs that actually um, expand and, and reducing uh, the sorts of limits that would um, disincentivize uh, them from expanding business. Then Kenji, you have the final word. Yeah, uh, so here's one aspirational, which is since the SMEs uh, have been informally part of Japan's safety net, right? So keep people employed by propping up the companies rather than create a safety net so that the companies can go bankrupt and then there are still people uh, th that'll be okay. So aspirational, which is a little harder, is to redo some of this social bargain to create a, a bigger safety net. So some of these struggling or non-competitive SMEs can go away uh, without the social trauma associated with that and an administration having to sort of um, take responsibility for that. So there's a little bit of talk about that, but make it much stronger. That's aspirational. Uh, second level aspirational, yes, I follow Robert, send people abroad. If you get into a foreign university that's maybe, I don't know, any ranking, top 150, absolutely just get funded to go abroad. There are smaller countries that do that. That all my contemporaries at Stanford who are from Thailand or from the uh, had generous scholarships that allowed them to do this kind of thing. So back to the sort of almost, if you would, developmental phase of let's try to think of people because it's the networks that you get from being abroad that then you can bring back to Japan. And even if you spend some time overseas, you usually don't completely quit being Japanese because somewhere you have are drawn back. So it's okay to do that. The low hanging fruit is contests where a focal point for a deep demographic or social issue, uh, shakai kadai is how it's uh, phrased, but a uh, higher resolution of that, uh, basically concrete problems and challenges that various startups are trying to solve, but various localities, the activist mayors, the governors, they don't know about these startups. 
So then the crux here would be having a contest for solving particular problems that would be a focal point for bringing these startups together with the types of mayors and governors that have the budgets to do that. Then the central government coming in and relaxing some of the procurement requirements so that the government can act as a good procurer. Now, this comes out of the... Uh, Department of Defense Silicon Valley history, but it doesn't have to be defense uh, and it doesn't have to be semiconductors. There can be this kind of government lead demand that is not giving subsidies or funding on this end, but actually buying from uh, companies because the best way to grow companies is to have good big customers, not just to have investments in the beginning. So that's the more practical low hanging fruit that I'd go for. Thank you so much. Um, we're ending on a positive note. Japan is not just back. There's a lot of momentum to get excited about Japan. Um, thank you so much for providing with much food for thought. Um, thank you, Izumi Duvalier, Kenji Kushida, Robert Feldman. And of course, thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you'll be able to join the Wilson Center again soon. Bye-bye.